you find freedom when you give yourself enough constraints that you can just focus in one direction. Which, again, it sounds paradoxical. We think, oh, freedom is doing whatever you want, when you want, which creates analysis paralysis, actually, for most people. Jacob, thank you so much for joining me today. No, no, thank you for the, thank you for the invite. Happy to be here. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so to get started, why don't you give listeners a little background about who you are, what you do, and, and we'll go from there. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm Jacob. I'm mainly active on, uh, on X, formerly known as uh, Twitter. And uh, so my background, so I'm an engineer. That's my real background, let's say. That's my academic background. And in the past few years, I've been focusing on uh, uh, mostly psychology and uh, human behavior. In particular, uh, I've been focusing on understanding why people spend too much time on their devices. That's been my that's been my focus for the yeah I'd say for the past yeah years, even two years. That has been uh, yeah my main focus. Okay. When you say engineer, are you talking software engineer or another type of engineer? Mm, so I am an hybrid engineer in the sense that I am a computer engineer and a management engineer because I wanted to have like a, you know, like a hybrid background that could give me more advantages into the marketplace, which it did. So it was a good choice at the end of the day. Nice. Where did the interest in psychology come from? Um, so it came from me trying to understand people around myself because I've always been introvert, but not antisocial, just introvert. It's just, uh, spending too much time with people. I just felt drained. So I just preferred, you know, observing and by observing people, I just, you know, I just got naturally curious about why they would take some decisions, why some of their decision would not have any reasoning basically, but they will still take the decision. So I got more onto, oh, every, every decision is emotional. And then we, when we do actually, <laughs> and then we, we, we use logic to rationalize the emotional decision. Yeah. So from there, and then I looking at my habits as well. I became more aware of what I was doing, what I wasn't doing. And I realized I was wasting too much time on socials, playing video games. So I dug deep into the science, understood the science behind it, helped myself and now and later, basically helping others do the same, just reclaiming back their all their free time. Yeah, it's interesting. I. I had never talked to you about it, but I, I figured you probably had uh, some balance issues in your past. And it's it seems like the typical way people become coaches or mentors in a certain thing is they struggle with that themselves. You know, people who are uh, addicted to something become addiction coaches and, and different things like that, which it makes sense, right? Because if if you're just somebody who has always been productive and never had any problems with your screen or anything like that, it, if if I had a screen addiction or something, it would be hard to rely on your advice, being like, "Well, you haven't been, you haven't been down that same path." So I think that makes it really relatable when people have a history with overcoming that same thing that they're teaching now. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's definitely an advantage, and it's easier to people even to trust you because they can see you've been through basically the same, the same uh, journey they are being through right now, and what you're doing is basically helping your past self get through, let's say, the hurdle once again. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm curious about the introvert part because I've I've come across a few people who are. You know, they post on social media, they have fairly decent followings, but they're introverts. How does, how does that work for you? Like, do you, I mean, do you feel social anxiety with, uh, an online presence at all? Or, or is it, 
Is it just mm. a different world because you're not physically around people? Yeah, I think it's different. I think it's different. Like in the online world, what I found was it's easier to have deep conversations like the one we're having now. It's easier to have, you know, uh, like for me, the draining, it comes when it's too many people in the same place. And when it's too much small talk and not real, not real progress, let's say in the conversation, that's when I feel my, <laughs> my energy training. Yeah, the small talk and meaningless conversations. Exactly. They exactly. have their place. I mean, there's a certain place for them. You can't always be talking deep conversations, but it's <laughs> way more interesting. If it's just small talk and things that I'm not interested with people, I'm like, okay, when is it time to leave? But as soon as like a real conversation starts, then I'm like, all right, let's get down here. Let's talk a little bit. Exactly. So, um, I like that. Exactly. So why don't you tell a little bit about when you were, you know, having trouble with how much time you were spending looking at a screen, where did you start to realize a problem was? Like when did, because a lot of people, I mean, we live in a society where people are just always on their screens and most people don't really recognize it as an issue. So how did you recognize that? And like, what were the signs? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'd say the first signs were in university. And the last signs were uh, during my first proper job in which I will feel always tired, always exhausted, always like I couldn't push more than that. Like I felt like I had like some invisible breaks, always brain fog. And, um, so with university, actually, uh, I stopped for a bit playing or, uh, like let's say being on screens too much. Uh, because I wasn't able like to progress, but once I was able to progress again, I got back because at that point in my mind, it wasn't a problem, right? If I can do it and then I can progress in other things, why not? Which is one of the biggest lies and the rationalization that we make. Yeah. And then at work, basically I was always tired. I was always exhausted. So I would, uh, I used to work for a big consulting company in Europe which is not in Italy, it's in another country in Belgium. So I went there to work and, uh, yeah, basically I was working eight, nine, 10, sometimes 11 hours a day. I was exhausted and then I would get home. And the only thing that I could do was, yeah, just waste time on screens because I didn't know better how to relax. Basically <laughs> I thought, yeah, I just, you know, watch a series, play a video game, scroll a bit. But then eventually I saw that. Even though I was sleeping, or at least I thought I was sleeping well, I was always exhausted. Hmm. So then I just looked at all my behaviors and yeah, the main ones were I wasn't training that much. I wasn't going to the gym at that time. So I started going to the gym, think got, got a lot better. And then once I got my screens under control, things got exponentially better. And I remember like doing like a complete, basically 360 or 180. <laughs> I don't know how you say it in, uh, in the U S in which I was doing really bad at the start. And then in my last month at that job, like I was doing extremely well. And, uh, like even my <laughs> manager got a bit confused. Like they thought, okay, this is not the same guy. And I knew why, because at that point I was, uh, because the problem with screens is that uh, they they are really good in replicating something that is a primary need. So for example, a video game basically replicates you making progress. So in your brain, if you're making progress in a video game with little effort, why would your brain work hard to make progress in something hard, like creating content, um, or, um, you know, just working basically yeah. that's the main, uh, that was the main issue. So once. Uh, I was able to understand the science behind the video games, especially video games and social media. Then I was able to come up with methods such that even if I was consuming socials, it was basically to my advantage and not to my disadvantage. It's interesting that one of the things I've noticed with video games, I've, I've played a few video games myself. I've, yeah, I like video games. I don't play a ton anymore. 
but I, I'm on a Discord server. I have some friends that play video games. And the word work gets used a lot in video games, um, it's, especially with certain type of games, like a, like a, a game where you have to build up your character. You have to go and, you know, build up your different skills and stuff like that. It's considered work to go and do that. Like you just have to put in the work to build up your character. It's kind of funny because it's not work. It's not work in the sense that we think of work where you're being productive. It's work in a game that's releasing dopamine and, and you're getting some sense of achievement in that. But it, it's an interesting concept to use the word work. And I, it's just something I've noticed because I'm around it a bit. It, what are, what's your thoughts on that? Like, are, are we tricking ourselves to thinking we're being productive when we're not? Um, the thing is what makes video game really addictive. So I like to always use the analogy between video games and uh, let's say real work, real work that takes time, you know, to, yeah. to master is that video games always give you the impression that you're making progress. There is always an XP bar here, an XP bar there, and a side quest and a main quest, and things are happening. Things are always happening. But if you're working a normal job, let's say, let's say as a consultant, uh, you're consulting for big companies, like before getting a raise or a promotion, like it takes months. Like you cannot, it's hard to see in real time the progress. It's just hard, almost impossible. But in video games, what you have is you always have the impression that you're making progress. So with that, what happens is that since you're making progress, you're releasing dopamine basically means we are doing a great job. We're making progress. Let's continue because you are on the right track. We're not getting exhausted. It's not exhausting. Let's keep continuing because if you think about it, let's say uh, hundreds of years ago, your, our brain will release dopamine when, let's say we get out of our house, we went exploring a certain zone, and after a while, we will find, let's say, water and fruits. Hmm. So in that moment, our brain releases dopamine because I found the fruits. We probably are in the zone which has all the fruits. Let's keep exploring. However, the, the limit there is a physical limit. That means when you get too tired, you just get home or it's too late. It becomes dangerous. So you just get home. Hmm. That's the main difference. But in a video game, like it's just, you can go on for a lot longer. So that's why you end up. Yeah. Like playing more than you expect because it's just, you're always under the spell or under the impression that you're making a lot of progress really fast. There's, there's something with, uh, it, it seems like with a video game, your, your path is a little bit more restricted too, right? Like you can, you can advance your character in a game, but there's not an unlimited w number of ways that you can do this. You don't have an unlimited number of options. It's restricted to the protocol of a game, what you can do. Whereas in real life, maybe you want to learn how to code. Maybe you want to learn how to make music and do a few other things. And each one of those things that you want to learn has hundreds, if not thousands or more different ways that you can approach it and different aspects of those things that you can learn. Um, and it, th there comes to a time where I know I get this sometimes when I, when I want to learn something, it's, oh, I want to learn how to code this thing. And it's something that I want to do. And it's just sitting there as something I want to do, but actually taking that first bite into it and actually getting into it is very difficult. Whereas I can pick up a game and say, okay, I'm level one. I want to get to level 10 tonight. Pretty easy. I know exactly what I need to do. Is that part of it? Just the not knowing where, like having so many options and not knowing where to start in the real world with different things. Yeah, that's definitely one of the bigger factor, 
which is with video games, basically people that become really good at playing video games, they develop their, let's say, uh, procedura, procedural problem solving. So they are good at solving problems that come in sequences. However, they lose the ability to solve problems that are more abstract. Hmm. Like let's say, for example, uh, getting a raise or getting a promotion or changing job. I mean, it's, it's 50, 50. I mean, it's not, it's not as abstract, but so with the games, what happens is that you develop that capacity. So everything else that's a bit, that that's a bit more abstract in terms of problem solving becomes harder because your, let's call it your abstract muscle, just atrophy, you just, yeah. you know, it gets, <laughs> it gets weaker. So I'd say, yeah, definitely clarity, clarity of what you have to do next. It's a bit factor on, uh, on why video games can become really addictive, really fast. In fact, one thing that, uh, uh, I used to work with people that had problems with, with video games. And one of the first things when it came to, let's say work was, uh, basically playing the counter to that, which was, uh, video games are addictive because they are clear. You don't want to work because your work is unclear. How can we make work as clear as a video game? Basically, How do you go about doing that? So you do that basically by, let's say you have to do a, a job. So what you do is you pretend you already did the job and then you ask yourself to get there, what do I need to do? And you get a step back. And before that, what do I need to do? And you get a step back. Basically you iterate from the, from the end till you get to the start. And when you get to the start, then you have your to-do list, which is like, let's say, for example, I want to find a job. Uh, I will pretend that I already found a job, but finding a job means, uh, having done a final interview and having done a final interview means having done two other interviews, which means having spoken to recruiters or managers, which means that you sent your CV and the, your CV has been accepted, which means you created your CV, which means you took a piece of paper or a word document and you wrote your name, your telephone number, your email, your, uh, blah, blah, blah. So now we have a to-do list. It's not abstract anymore. Hmm. You got to the start of it and you have a to-do list. Another way you can do that is basically giving you, giving yourself constraints. So for example, I want to learn how to code with Python. You will go, I want to learn how to code, uh, data analysis. I want to learn how to do data analysis. And then you will constrain again. I will, I want to learn how to do data analysis on uh, a data set. And then you keep constraining which kind of data set, how big is the data set? So the more you constrained, the less options you give your brain, the more you can channel your energy into a single direction, which is what video games do. So from video games and other, uh, even from social media, you can learn why we get addicted and use that same concept to your advantage. So they're actually useful. Like the mechanism is useful because okay. it shows you how the human brain works. Even in writing, what I do is the same. Like let's say I want to write about something which I'm not clear. I start niching down. I start giving myself constraint and it always works because by which in today's world is sounds paradoxical, but you find freedom when you give yourself enough constraints that you can just focus in one direction, which again, it sounds paradoxical. We think oh, freedom is doing whatever you want when you want, which creates analysis paralysis actually for most people. Yeah. So by giving yourself constraints, basically you're telling yourself all my energy is going to be channeled into this direction or this one direction, which gives you infinite freedom because it just, you're free to focus on one thing at a time. It makes sense when I've, uh, I've, I've produced music for years and there's, uh, people will start collecting plugins and different, different tools that they can use for music. And one of a big technique for creating is to just limit yourself to a certain number of tools and say, you're going to create with these and then you're not going to touch anything else and see what you can come up with. And that sometimes that 
constraint can really free you up and be like, well, I don't have another option. I can't sit there and just scroll through this list of plugins to use. So I'm just going to use the the couple plugins that I've told myself I can use for this project and go. And uh, yeah, you can find yourself creating a lot more. And it makes sense from the when you're tackling a big a big task, like learning how to write a program or something, because when before you break it down into those steps, you're looking at it as like, well, there's this program that I want to create, but there's a thousand different ways that I can get started. So you, I, I like that iterating from the back or like going, uh, deconstructing the process mm -hmm. from yep. the finished product. I, I really like that. But um, when it comes to, so games are one thing. You said social media has some similarities to games. Uh, can you explain that a bit? Um, social media is a bit different. I mean, they in social media, they are, I mean, yeah, let's say the algorithm still mimics the feeling of making progress. However, it works a bit different in the sense that, um, like a social media algorithm, a social media feed is, is the same as, uh, like going to the casino and playing with a slot machine in the sense that. Uh, we keep scrolling because we know that eventually we will find something that we like. Otherwise, it wouldn't be scrolling. Yeah, makes sense. And that's the whole point. The maximum amount of dopamine, which is like the maximum amount of, let's call it, I'm going into the right direction, it's released during the anticipation of the reward, not during the reward. It's not when we find what we like, it's when we search for what we like. Hmm. So what the algo does is basically it gives you something that you like, and then it gives you three that you don't, and then it gives you something else that you like. So the time that piles up is the time between the things that we like. So it's the time within one search to the other. It's not actually the time of us consuming the content. It's us searching for the content. Is that because we don't know what's coming? It's like, we, it's like endless we can anything could potentially be what we find and then exactly reality so it's like gambling. Never... yeah it's like gambling it's uh people gamble because they know that eventually there's always a chance that they will win and what they get hooked on is not the win or the loss is the anticipation of the win hmm. like a gambler actually doesn't care if he wins or he loses he cares about uh, anticipating the win. Mm. I, I'd imagine the the win, or in social media's case, the actual content that, that you consume never quite lives up to the potential of what it can be. Is that right? Uh, I think I think it depends. In the sense that if you are like I use X mainly because I think the best content is there. So what I do on X is a, I consume in an active way. So if I read a thread, let's say, and the thread did really well, what I will do is deconstruct the thread because I want to use that for my threads, for example. Or if I read a tweet, I would ask myself, why did the tweet do so well? Hmm. And I will find a way. So that's what I call an active consumption yeah. because if I passively consume, I might sell myself the fantasy that I'm learning while I'm not learning anything, because unless I'm applying something, there is no learning. I mean, maybe the learning lasts like five seconds, 10 seconds, and then we are on to the next. So it's how, because if you're not using it, then the brain doesn't prioritize it. So it just, you know, it just forgets, which yeah. is useful, but I think one of the biggest illusion is that some people think oh, I'm on X, I'm scrolling on X because I'm learning. And actually they're not learning anything. They have the illusion that they are learning, but they aren't learning. Because if I ask them questions about that content, they don't remember. So. <laughs> how do you transition from, uh, how do you make that transition from active, active scrolling to, from, uh, you know, doom scrolling or whatever you, you might call it to active scrolling? How do you, can you 
give a little bit of insight into your mindset when mm-hmm. you're when you approach. Like, say you log on to X, you're not posting right now. You're going to be consuming. Can you maybe talk about how you choose who you what post you're going to look at, and then mm-hmm. how you actually go about that? How your mindset is? Yeah. So I mainly use lists of people that let's say I want to engage with, perhaps they are friends that I want to support, or they are people that I want to consume the content because I know that they write good content. So I will learn from that. So what I will do is I will set, first of all, I will set my intention. Why did I open the app or why did I go to the website? And then I would use a list. I mainly use lists. I don't like to scroll the timeline. It's just too time consuming. Even if you find good things, it's just too time consuming. Yeah. So I will just, um, I will just pick some accounts and then consume the, their content from time to time. And then have, let's say on the right, a word document in which I'm breaking down things. And there are two advantages of that. So the first advantage is that you become an active user instead of a passive user. So you actually get to question what you are consuming. This is another problem, which if you want, we can talk about later. And the second of all, you, because when it comes to social media, the main problem is that dopamine is released, but effort is not made. Like you're not making any effort when you scroll, Hmm. like you're not expending energy. So by putting in effort in uh, actually studying the content and applying the content, doing something with the content, you are actually putting in the work. So your session is going to be lower, I mean, uh, shorter by default, unless you are uh, in the zone, let's say, and time is passing. But in that case, you are actively consuming. You are using it to your advantage and you're not used by the algorithm. Hmm. That's the main advantage. I, I would imagine some people hear that and they say, well, that's taking all the fun out of it. I don't want to, because a lot of people want to do things like social media, uh, TV, which I'd imagine you lump in with screen time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and TV is a bit different. But there are some similarities, in my opinion, too, because there are activities that people want to do to waste some time. People, maybe they're sitting at a bus stop and they don't have anything to do, so they pull their phone up, they go to their favorite social media app, and they just start consuming. And it's the same thing with TV. People get off work and they're like, well, I've already done my work for the day, so I'm just going to waste some time they probably don't consider it wasting time, but they're relaxing. They consider it relaxing. And they probably would say the same thing around social media. So what would you have to say to that? Like, I want to relax and consume some content. Why should I be productive with it? I, I would just ask, like, if, like, are you okay with your life? Like, uh, I had people in many DMs asking me why I don't work basically with everybody. And my answer is always the same because, uh, the thing is the more money people make, the more they value their time, Mm. the less money people make, the more they value money and the less they value time. So in my field, what I do is generally I work with people that are, they have money, they are set. They just want more time. And one of my constraints is always, if you don't respect your time enough, I will not work with you. That makes sense. So for me, it's uh, if you are okay with where life is, then we don't need to work together. But if you are complaining and then you want to also have fun, as they say, which is not fun at all, it's just the illusion of having fun, then uh, (laughs) there's nothing I can do. It, it makes sense uh, when we we're deciding where to allocate our time. If you don't value your time, you'll spend a lot of time doing, not even like getting away from screens for a moment. You'll spend time doing something that maybe took you an hour, but you could have spent 
five dollars having somebody else do that for you. So you're really bad at allocating your own resources and then when when it comes time to make money, you're not as proficient as or productive as you could be. So it, it does make sense that people should value their time more to get the most benefit from that. Yeah. There's another big factor, huh? There's another big factor that not many people talk about, which is uh, when when you are always stimulated by something, let's say video games, Netflix, TV, social media, what you are doing is you are training your brain to be distracted and get rewarded basically for doing nothing. This is the scientific part. Like there is the moral part, which is like with your time, you do whatever you want. However, there is like the scientific part, which we, that's subjective. That's objective truth. The other one, it could be more subjective. Like, oh, I have three hours. I can just waste them. Cool. However, if you're trying to progress, let's say professionally, what you're doing is in your free time, you are undoing all the progress that you are making at work. So for example, if your work uh, needs you to be like productive and hyper-focused, what you're doing in your free time is undoing that progress. Hmm. It's like I'm training for a, let's say, <laughs> it's like I'm training for a, for a run. And then in my free time, when I'm not training, I'm eating like junk food. That's the effect that's happening there. Yeah. So let's say I'm working as a consultant or as a lawyer. So I need to concentrate a lot. I need to focus a lot. And then I get home and I, and I live a distracted life. What I'm doing is I'm hijacking my ability. I'm reducing my ability to develop myself in my work. Because this, <laughs> I'm basically, uh, training myself to be distracted instead of focused. That's a big part. That's a really big part. And that's, again, unfortunately, that's not, there's a little debate that we can make there because it's literally, that's literally that. That's how the brain works. That's why uh, young people, all of these young people, like they all have, have ADHD, for example. I mean, not all, but majority, because short form content, especially when the brain is developing, is literally training their brain to be distracted because you jump from one post to the other. And the same is for adults. You don't get the same effect. However, what you get is you are training your focused part and then training your distracted part. So your focused part is just, you know, it isn't developing as it should. How do you, how do you relax? How do you take, how do you personally take time away from things and relax? Like what's a relaxing activity to you if you're avoiding screen time and distractions? Because a lot of people, I'm, I'm sure some people hear you and they say, well, I don't, I can't be productive every single minute of every day. Sometimes I don't want to be productive. So what, what do you think people should be doing there? What do you do? It's a, uh, so what I, I get this question a lot, which for me was surprising, to be honest. But my answer is, uh, pretend technology or any artificial mean is not present. Like pretend we go back 200 years, not more than 200, let's say 2000 years or whatever. When technology wasn't a thing, what would people do in that time to relax? Uh, go for a walk, uh, gyms. Did we have gyms? Yeah, let's say we had gyms 2000 years ago. Uh, go to the gym, uh, do a sauna, steam room, yeah. just touch some grass, or as I like to say, cut some grass. Like if you didn't, like people, people talk about touching grass, but not enough people talk about like cutting grass. Like I did that, like it's fun, that's fun. <laughs> and it's yeah. relaxing. Stay, stay in nature, basically. Just pretend for a moment, technology doesn't exist. And ask yourself, what would myself 2000 years ago do to relax? Because if it's artificial, that means a man created it. So that means it's not needed. Mm. That makes sense. What do you, what are your views on 
like artificial intelligence and utilizing AI for for both productivity and leisure time because there is there are both possibilities with that. Mm -hmm. So I think AI is a double-edged sword in the sense that for when it comes to productive activities, it's really good like to basically replace your time with uh, automation. So that's great. However, then there is the other part of the, of this world, let's say, which is uh, like the disadvantage, which is that, uh, so, um, so when it comes to screens, basically you have three main, uh, I call them the three main demons, which are video games, social media, and adult content. Those are like the three main demons. So with AI, the problem with AI, this is like for me, the main problem is that you can, it's like injecting steroids in those demons, because what happens is that you make them even more addictive because you can recreate a better reality hmm. because people now with AI can basically be inside the experience. They can feel basically the same way they would feel if that was real. I mean, not the same, but it's much more potent. So that makes it even more addictive. But for the good part, let's say, I think AI is it's really good. I use AI myself to automate some tasks, to do market research, for example, or uh, let's say I have a text that's not structured. I will just plug the test into the AI to get like a more structured text instead of like going through all the pages. So I think AI, it's, it's, it's really good. But then again, like you have the other part of the equation, which is you can take whatever is already present and make it much better or much worse. And with much worse, I mean, much more uh, addictive. I would agree that AI is definitely a double-edged sword. It really comes down to how we use it. And there's more than just productivity. It, I mean, there's implications for war and all kinds of different things mm -hmm. where it's like, sometimes I feel people are either pro or against, like people like to be binary with their, with their choices. Right. And it's like, everything is nuanced to me. <laughs> so I look at it and like, well, AI is really powerful, can be used for great things, but it all depends on how it's programmed, how it's used. That matters in every case because I don't, I don't want to see AI used for killing people, but I want to see AI used for helping people who can't see, can't read, different things like that. And, uh, and, and for our own productivity, I want to see it used for these great things. And I, I don't think that's inherently going to happen in, unless we guide it in that direction. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's as you said, it's nuanced in the sense that you can you, you can pick a thing, let's say that does 100 things, and then you can be, I like this 90, I don't like this 10. Yeah. I think that's, that's how we should approach technology and life in general. Like, that's just yeah. my <laughs> philosophy there. Is there. Is there a healthy amount of video games that somebody can stick to? Can somebody, if somebody's maybe playing an absurd amount, eight, 12 hours a day. And they're like, I don't want to stop playing video games, but I want to get control of my life. When you're coaching people, would you have them just stop completely or would you have them taper it down and, and limit themselves to a certain, you know, time frame per day? Um, ideally I would, uh, I would help them like stop completely. Because the problem of the problem of, as people say, with balance or with, uh, what's the word, uh, what's the word that everybody uses? Ah, it's all about moderation. Oh my God. Mm. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's the biggest pitfall. I think like that's the biggest BS society sells to people. Ah, you can drink just in moderation. Like every drinker started in moderation. Every alcoholic started moderation. Every, is everybody going to be alcoholic? I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's a game of probabilities. So instead of complaining about something, we can remove the problem at the root. So when I say, for example, to somebody, you can, 
you can play video games in the weekend. What I'm doing is actually, I'm making him looking forward to the weekend to play. Mm. I'm not helping him stop. Like on paper, it sounds cool, right? Oh, I will just play in the, in the weekend. But with me telling him that it's, I'm giving him basically a, an incentive. Okay. You need to look forward for the weekend because you're gonna play, which isn't the point. The point is to have all that progress made in real life. And again, we come back to the point of before, like if you are happy with your life, which by the way, video games, social media and any stimulants, they make you less motivated and less ambitious because again, they give you the impression, the illusion that you're making progress. Yeah. So let's say if my goal is to get 100 points in this thing, my new goal, when I talk to people will be, no, I'm just, I'm just okay with 70 because with me being so stimulated again, like I'm giving myself the illusion I'm making progress. I need, to, I don't need to excel at this thing. I can just, you know, just get by and it's fine. You see, like people get like, that's how people get lazy because they're getting free progress for no effort. So why would you work hard? That's let's say the internal dialogue you have in your brain. Every, every time you take a decision, that's internal dialogue. Is there another activity that I can do with minimal effort? That's going to give me more progress. That's why, for example, spiking your dopamine before doing hard work is like the worst thing you can do because it's like going from, we can have infinite progress with no effort to, we will have minimal progress with a lot of effort. So it's like your brain like gets confused. Like it's like, what, what are you doing here? Like we were just having fun there, as they say, having infinite progress, no effort. And now we are asking me like to work on this project. Nah, I don't want to do that. That makes sense. I've, I've been in that situation. I've played a video game or something like that and, and then gone back to work and I'm like, I just want to play the video game now. I just, I just want to go back to the fun thing. Mm -hmm. So that makes a lot of sense that it, it would be the worst thing that you can do right before yeah, going to work. It's so. the worst. <laughs> when it comes to balance, you brought up alcohol, which, uh, I've had a drinking problem in my life. I don't drink anymore and I don't drink at all. Every once in a while, if somebody, I do like beer. So if somebody is drinking a beer, I'll have a sip of it just to taste it. I don't drink though. Um, and I know if I'm doing anything more than just tasting it there, it's going to end up, I'm going to have a, a night where I end up uh, just drinking too much. And uh, so, yeah, I don't really consume it, but when it comes to screen time, most people can't get rid of the screen altogether. Some people have to be on social media for work. And if they don't have to be on social media, they at least have to be on a computer using it. So balance is hard uh, as and, and not ideal in the case of video games and stuff like that. So how do you get to that balanced position with screen time when somebody has an issue with it, they can't drop it completely, but they have to find that balance. So mm -hmm. you're kind of stuck in that position where you do need to take the less ideal route. They can't just get away from it completely. So instead of talking about balance, even with clients, I like to talk about intentionality. So what are you doing with those hours? Like I had a client, he used to spend too much time on the news, on social media. And he asked me like, I want to learn how to, I think it was trading. I was thinking about learning how to trade. So I was thinking of dropping two hours of, uh, X basically consuming news on X for two hours of trading. And I said, why don't you drop two hours of X and you replace it with four hours of trading? Like, what's the problem with that? My, my thing is not, it's not like cutting screen time It's about what are you doing with that screen time? Like, is mm -hmm. it helping you get to the destination that you want to get to? And in this case, it will be, uh, progressing, uh, personally or financially or, uh, yeah, or professionally. That's how I, I envision it. Like there's a, there's a section that I don't go through with all my clients, which is called basically content curation, which basically what I ask my clients is 
first thing that they need to do is unfollow everybody, everybody, I don't care who it is, and then follow only accounts that are actively helping them get into the direction in which you're going. Yeah, that makes sense. When, when it comes to this being intentional, is there like a goal setting process that you're typically going with or, or writing down what people want? How do, how do you help people figure out what their intentions are if maybe they're not quite clear? Yeah, yeah. I will start from asking them basic questions, uh, some more, let's say, deep questions like, what is your purpose, for example? That's a question that I really like a lot. And basically from there, understanding, okay, to get to this purpose, we will need, let's say, 10 things. So let's say my purpose is to be the best man I can be, which is quite abstract. Like, what does it mean? So uh, from the first purpose, you will have like 10 sub purposes, which will be, be the best, for example, husband be the best uh, boyfriend, be the best, um, what else? Be the best professional I can be, or be the best uh, with my neighbors. And from there, you will just break it down. Okay, what does it mean be the best dad? Uh, do X, Y, Z. So what you do is you start from a bigger purpose and you make sure all the actions or the, or the sub purposes and the sub goals are all directed for your big purpose. So that gives you clarity. Okay. Should I follow this account or not? Okay. Okay. Does it help you with your overall purpose? No, then there's no need to follow it. Yeah. And if there is the need, then we would look at, okay, what's the need? Why can't you stop, let's say consuming and just come with a, a random account? Let's say, why can't you stop consuming Mr. Beast content? I don't know. I never watched Mr. Beast. Like, I'm not interested in that, but let's say somebody can't stop. So I will go through the process. Okay. What is it about that keeps you hooked? It might be, I don't know, the sounds. It might be the, how the video is made. So we will go through a process of how do we unhook ourselves, which basically it's a, every behavior that we have, it's an utilitarian behavior. Like even if we do drugs, like there is an utility there. Like I'm trying to fill a void. The problem is sometimes there is a real void, but sometimes there is a perceived void. And unfortunately, our mind doesn't recognize the difference between the two. If it's something perceived, for the mind, it's real. Hmm. So for example, if I'm consuming a certain amount of content, a certain type of content because I feel lonely, then loneliness might be a perceived loneliness. Why? Because probably this person has other people around the circle. So it's a made up loneliness. So we will go through that. Basically we would bec become aware again about actually we have people. So there is like a little exercise that I like to do, which is uh, actually looked it up this morning as well. Because I wanted to be prepared, <laughs> which is, uh, it's called the switch or switch pattern in which we have a behavior that let's say you want to drop and you have another behavior that you want to replace with. So let's say I want to drop biting my nails. So I would close my eyes, think about myself biting my nails and I will create an image. And then I will create a smaller image of me, let's say, crossing my hands and not biting my nails. And then what I will do is I will play with my imagination and make that smaller image bigger, 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 and bigger till the first image about me biting my nails will just explode and go away. So I would repeatedly do this exercise such that now when I get triggered to bite my nails, I have like the substitute which is in my mind basically. And the substitute is, if I feel the need to bite my nail, I can just cross my hand. Hmm. That's a really interesting technique. Yeah, it's an, uh, I think it's called, I think it's an, an LNP technique, Neuro Linguistic Programming Technique, okay. which, uh, yeah, they work, they work. They, they are used even with addictions, even with people that are, let's say, addicted to smoking. What they will do is, first of all, they will find the root cause, which generally is security. Like 
if you went through college or university or even high school, like, and I've seen it as well. Many people started smoking for the company of other people. They weren't mm -hmm. interested in, uh, uh, let's say smoking because they made them relaxed, which is not true, of course, but they were more interested in when I'm, when I smoke with people, I feel like I'm included. I feel yeah. secure because the, yeah. the goal of the subconscious is making us secure. That's the main goal. Doesn't matter how. Yeah. If it's smoking, if it's doing other stuff, it doesn't matter. So what we do is we understand the need. We look at the need. Is this a perceived need or is it a real need? And then we find another way to get that need uh, satisfied or met. And this technique helps in replacing, like, let's say your uh, maladaptive behavior with a better behavior. Okay. You mentioned three, three, uh, did you call them three demons, the adult content, video games. What was the other one? Uh, social media. Social media. Okay. Between those three, is there any of them that are harder to deal with or are they, they all pretty much equal and different on their own levels? I think the hardest one is probably adult content because basically it, what it does, it, it simulates uh, our self-reproducing, which is the ultimate, let's say, human goal, like to replicate our species. Yeah. So with that, we are simulating ourselves, replicating. So our brain is like, good, good, you are replicating. And then reality hits and you did nothing. That's why people get into shame cycles. And then the shame makes you get back to that same behavior because it's the only behavior in that moment that makes you feel less shame which then makes you feel shame. It's like an end cycle of shame. Video games, they mimic progress, which is another, let's say, uh, primary human need. That's why, for example, men tend to get addicted more to video games because we are, because we are more, you know, competitive. We are mm. more looking for progress. And then social media is more addictive for females because uh, basically receiving likes, it means approval. So biologically, it means you're getting attention from the opposite sex with the cons, which again, biologically means, uh, I will have a higher chance of, uh, giving birth. Hmm. And that's why, uh, adult content is basically fake sex for men and social media is fake attention for women. But since we can get it basically at infinite because you can just click, right? Or you can just post a new photo of you being a bit provocative and you will get likes. And for us, we can just, you know, scroll through a catalog of infinite women with infinite size, with uh, all the ethnicities, and we will find something that will satisfy, let's say, our fantasy. However, for our brain, this is an effect called Coolidge effect. Every time we introduce a new woman, even though it's virtual, for us, it's like a, the novelty will make us want to mate with a new woman as well. And they did this exercise, this, sorry, this exercise, this experiment, I think with a chicken, they introduced, uh, what's the, what's the female chicken? I don't know, <laughs> whatever. Um, I think just chicken, right? Yeah, I think chicken. It's a, so, a, a ah, no, it's a rooster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so with a rooster, they introduced a chicken, he will mate, and then he will get let's say tired, he will not mate again with the same chicken. However, if they kept introducing new chickens, he will just go at, he will just continue. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the same effect with, uh, adult content. That's why it's more dangerous. How do you go about coaching people with adult content? Cause uh, I mean, there's, there seems to be some, it, it, it seems like there would be some difficulty with that too, because mm -hmm. I'd imagine people don't always want to talk about it too. Even people who have a problem with it aren't necessarily going to want to articulate that problem. And it, it's something that most people are doing in private. So nobody really knows. And I mean, I've, I've consumed adult content and it is everywhere too. It's like there's mm -hmm. adult content or provocative content like that all over TV, all over social media. And 
you know, it's always a few clicks away to get to adult content. So yep. how do you, how do you go about coaching people when it comes to that? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, that's on purpose. That's made on purpose. It's part of a, let's say of a, of a bigger thing that, you know, like, especially with men, like if you want to attack men, you, you can just attack his sexuality. And basically tell, telling him just, yeah, you know, that life energy that gives birth, basically just waste it. It's normal, which I mean, clearly doesn't make any sense. However, that's how you make things. That's how you make things normal. So even then, like the first step with me, when I work with these clients is just, I just ask them, like, is it so, like, if it's normal in society, let's talk about it as a normal thing. Let's talk about it as, you know, as we were talking about school or work, it's normal, right? So the goal with that is to basically break the wall created by shame. If everybody watches it, that's one thing I always say. If everybody watches it, then let's talk about it. Like, what's the problem with that? So I just make sure that the client gets into a comfortable position or situation in which, yeah, I mean, it's so normalized in society. Why do we need to feel shameful about either watching it or consuming it? So that's the first step. The first step is just to say, look, like it's normal. Like I think 85%, 90% of men consume that. So, I mean, let's talk about it. And then after that, we will look at, okay, but why are you consuming it? So it could be. It could be different. It could be different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, reasons. But the main ones are uh, like people think that they are like sexual reasons, but it's not like sexual reason. Like there's a difference between, let's say, love and lust. Like adult content is more lust than love. It's completely different between, let's say, how would you love real women and how would you lust behind the women? Because what's being promoted in society is not law. It's called law, but it's lust. Definitely. When every woman can be looked by any man, that's lust. It's not love. There's a big difference. However, we tend to use umbrella terms in society just to make things look, let's say, less serious than they are. So again, first thing, break the shame wall. Second thing is understand what's the need behind it. And how can we satisfy that need in a healthy way? And again, we will try to understand, is it a perceived need? Is it a real need? Because most of the time it's a, it's a perceived need. Like a guy is not born needing to watch adult content. Hmm. It doesn't exist. Like it's not a, he will feel a need later, let's say to mate with a real human being. So the problem with porn is that it replicates that at a high level. So in that moment, we think that we are mating with a real human. So the brain comes up with rationalization, which is, oh, nobody loves me. I can just watch this or uh, I will never, I don't know, like find a girlfriend or a wife. So I might as well do this. And for that, you remember when we spoke about purpose, purpose comes into, into the picture. So what's your purpose? So in that case, we would create a life, a routine, habits in which basically watching adult content is not an option. It just doesn't make sense. So that's one part. And then we will work at a subconscious level in which, as we did for, uh, let's say, for uh, binding our nails, right? Everybody, you will feel every time you will feel you want to watch that adult content. We would map your trigger with something else. For example, no, that's not your brain telling you you want to watch adult content. That's your brain telling you that you need to relax or you need to meditate, for example. So we would yeah. work. It takes some time, of course, because you're like reprogramming your brain, but it works in the long run because you are, you're changing the mapping because again, nobody's born with that need. It's a perceived need. Like nobody's born from, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, now. Suddenly I feel the need to go on the web and watch, you know, two human beings doing nasty stuff. Like it doesn't work that way. <laughs> when it comes to, I mean, you mentioned it's intentional that it's everywhere. 
Is that is that just a money thing, or do you think there's something else that's that drives that? I mean, adult content just being everywhere. I mean, we're on X. It's all over on X. It's um, <laughs> you you make a post on a larger account, you reply to somebody, and you're going to get added by a bunch of sex bots. Uh, you go on I mean, Instagram is full of uh, risque content with women and. TikTok, same thing. All the social medias are, websites are full of it. I mean, it is literally all over. Why do you think that is? Is it just money or is it something more? It's um, it's both money and it's uh, influence and control. So for example, if I wanted to make you, uh, if I wanted to sedate a man, I would just ask a man to just waste his sexual energy. Because in that case, what I can do is I can do things that he will not like. Let's say I want to introduce a, a law. So instead of risking to have a bunch of angry men with high testosterone being angry at me and then basically doing a revolution because they don't like the laws, I would just give them entertainment. I would just, uh, just give them adult content, alcohol, uh, weed, video games, and just tell them, yeah, just... Just spend your time doing this and everything will be fine. Mm. That's how, that's why in, in many of my tweets, I call this a psychological war with invisible bullets, which are psychological bullets. I don't need to fight you with real bullets. I can just make you how to disqualify yourself, which is done by giving you basically everything that spikes your dopamine for free, because then you don't need to work hard. So you are not competitive anymore. Yeah. Imagine you playing a go. Uh, uh, have you played sport in your life? Yeah. I have. What What sport did you play? I was a wrestler. Okay. And I like basketball too. I used to play a little okay. bit, bit Let, of basketball when I was younger. Okay. Let's say you are wrestling a guy, and at any moment you have the the possibility to give up, and nothing will happen. Nothing. That's the same as having like infinite uh, overstimulation at a cheap price. Or even in basketball, let's say you are playing basketball and you can just say, ah, I give up. The game is finished. It's the same. Why would you work hard when you have the option to quit and nothing will happen? I mean, of course, things happen in the long run, but in the moment, nothing happens. Yeah, it, it, it is very interesting. I mean, porn is not exactly new there's been porn for a long time but the accessibility of it is very new um mm -hmm. i mean i grew up with computers and i mean back then i mean i when i was a little kid i looked at some uh nude images but i remember it you know it took time for it to download like just an image and now people have videos and they can just go through video after video and it it just humans have never had this in their like in human history we've never had this where so much is accessible without putting money in most i mean children can largely get access to it without giving any kind of verification it, it is it's troubling i mean and and children especially being exposed to this and not really understanding how to have a normal relationship, not understanding that like it actually takes work to get a girl that you want to be with and to get to the point where you're having sexual relations with them. It, it, there's a lot to it. I mean, how do you, how, just what's your opinion on that? Like, what are we, are we, is it just a, is there a solution? I mean, mm -hmm. other than just porn being illegal at some point, which who knows if that would even do it either because alcohol was illegal at some point. But is it just is it just going to get worse? Now people are going to be able to create AI videos or they're going to be able to take somebody's face that they feel attracted to and put it on an AI generated nude body and and now they have a nude picture it's not that person but they can pretend that like they can fulfill 
any fantasy that that they want. Is it just going to get worse? Yeah, yeah, it's going to get worse. But and the only solution is knowledge. Like it's for every person in this planet. Sooner or later, they're going to encounter that, whether it's that or something else that they will come up with. So the only solution is knowledge. It's being, it's knowing the enemy. Like to fight the enemy, you need to know the enemy first. Yeah. And to know the enemy, it means that parents need to have open conversation about. Look, like you're gonna find this. Uh, be careful. It's gonna be addictive. They're gonna try in any way to put it into your brain to make you addictive. Addicted. So you want uh, basically such that you will not be able to, you know, to fulfill your dreams or to uh, get to your goals because it's, mm. it's not possible. Like it's not possible to operate at 100% when you always have an escape. It's just not possible. Like it's, it's just yeah. human. So knowledge, knowledge and openness, openness, like being open about, look, like you're going to encounter this, you're going to see this and you want to talk about it, we are here. Like, I remember when I first encountered it, like the first thing was, I cannot talk about this to my parents. Because there is this taboo, right? You don't talk about these things. However, yeah. when I will be a parent, I will be 1000% open with my children and be like, look, like, this is the real world. You're going to encounter this. It's not going to be easy because it's going to be shoved like from... <laughs> left and right and center <laughs> yeah. and uh let's be open about it there's no shame because the biggest thing is shame here because that industry basically uses shame to make people even use it more like for example like do you know why in uh, and i don't know if they if they do it uh if they still do it do you know why in uh on uh, on cigarette packs, they write smoking uh, kills you. No, I mean just to get people to stop. I'd imagine. Nope, because when you see smoking kills you, what's if you are a smoker? How do you feel? Mm. Yeah, I mean you feel like crap. You're like, well, I'm... yeah, it's a shaming thing. Yeah, and what do I... you do when you feel like crap? You smoke. You smoke. Yeah. So it's, I think it's intentional. Hmm. I've never thought about that, but that actually does make sense. Um, can you explain how that's done in, in porn? In porn, it's, it's the shame. So for example, let's say I perceive the need that I want to consume it because otherwise nobody loves me. And uh, uh, I'm trying to fill a void, let's say. So what, what happens is that I consume it. I think the void is being filled. And then once I, I get back to, let's say reality, I'm ashamed because actually I did nothing. I just wasted my energy and my time and nobody loves me anyway, which is not yeah. true, but that's another story. <laughs> and, uh, so that creates shame. And when you feel shame, what happens is that you need something to placate the shame, which normally is another stimulant, which it's uh, adult content most of the times, if that's what you use, if, if not worse. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole thing about having conversations with your children <laughs> probably sounds pretty uncomfortable to a lot of people because I mean, Historically, the birds and the bees conversation was the conversation that people didn't want to have with their children that you eventually need to have with them because they're going to come across sex at some point. But porn is even more abundant than sexual, real sexual opportunities. And just from my own experience, I mean, I remember the people I would talk about with about porn with were my peers, which is probably not a great place to go to, to talk about that because they're in that same mindset of, they don't see anything wrong with it. It wasn't until later in my life where I was like, yeah, I don't think porn is a great thing. Um, uh, there was a time where I didn't think it was a big deal. 
But then later in life, I'm like, yeah, it's pretty destructive. Uh, and you don't realize that as a child. And I, I think those conversations are important to have with children. Children or and young adults, men, are not always self-aware enough to really grasp what you're giving them as far as knowledge. So while I do think knowledge is important, how do you get that knowledge to to land with people whose brains are still developing and they they don't especially children they don't see the long-term consequences of things. They tend to look, think about short term. A year is a very long time for somebody who's seven, 17 years old. Um Five years is almost unthinkable for a lot of 17 year olds. How do you get that message to sit with somebody who doesn't have that forward thinking mentality? So I would, uh, I would focus on immediate, I would focus on immediate, uh, uh, effects. So for example, when I'm speaking about this, I would use, let's say a healthy relationship as an example. And I would use, let's say, the relationship between myself and my wife. I will tell this thing here has been made such that I don't know, like uh, mom and dad uh, would argue, mom and dad would do bad things, for example, or they wouldn't be good with you, or they will cheat, they wouldn't be good human beings. Like basically showing that right now we are doing good because we are not using this thing. But if we were to use this thing, you wouldn't be happy with us as a child with this is, uh, on the, uh, what's the word? This is instantaneous. It's not like in one year. I would yeah. focus on finding, uh, instantaneous consequences, which as you said, it's not, it's not always easy because for some of them, like you get the effect later, but I would say like even for uh, his development as a child, I would say you, you will be more, uh, you will feel more, uh, sad. You will feel more, you know, you will have less energy. And those are all, uh, uh things that happen, uh, in that time. Like you don't need to wait. Yeah. So I will focus on, okay, what's going to happen now if this thing enters our household now, not later. Yeah. That makes sense. What are the biggest challenges you've seen, it, not just with porn, but with screen addiction in general? What are the biggest challenges you've faced with helping people? And, and have you come across people where it just didn't work out that you felt like you couldn't help them or maybe they weren't? I would imagine if that comes to be the case, that's usually because they're not in a place, they're not mentally wanting to right yeah yeah exactly uh so i so when i started i used to you know to get some experience in i used to work with some people even for free and then once i got the experience and the results i would work on the paid service basically and uh i had only one case of person that it didn't work out but that was simply because like he wasn't doing, let's say the homework. So I don't know how to classify that. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's strange. It was strange. Would you, do you think that's more tied to not wanting to quit? Yeah. Not wanting, not wanting well, to, to have a better life. Yeah, absolutely. Well, like a split. Cause a lot of people. I mean, smokers are, are a great example. You'll see smokers all the time taking a puff and saying, don't get started with this. Don't like, they'll tell people don't ever smoke. And you're as a non-smoker, you might be looking at them like, then why are you, why are you smoking? If you're recommending it, you know, not, and I've smoked cigarettes in my life too, but I just, I quit. I was younger when I did it, but is, is that it just like the the split between what we want and what we're actually willing to work toward. If you, if you don't have a bigger reason, let's say to quit something, you will not quit. There is no reason to quit. That's the thing. That's why I'm big on purpose. When your yeah. purpose is clear, then it's easier to, 
set up a life in which, let's say, the maladaptive behavior is just not an option. It's not that you, it's not that you, because what I do different is uh, I don't, I don't ask people like to rely on willpower because I mean, willpower, it's finite. That means sooner or later, you're just, just going to relapse. We focus on creating systems. We focus on subconscious level thinking, basically subconscious level emotions to create a reality in which the maladaptive behavior, it just doesn't fit. Hmm. It's just like people that work with me, basically now they tell me that sometimes I have cravings and I'm about to do it. And I'm like, I, mean, I can't, <laughs> it's just, I can't, like, it's just not part of my reality anymore. Yeah. Can you dive into that a little bit more? Like what is a system where it's no longer an option? Somebody might be listening and saying, well, that sounds nice. I would want that system, but I don't, I'm not clear on how to create that system. How do, how do you go about creating a system where these mm -hmm. maladaptive tools, not tools, maladaptive behaviors are not fitting in with the system anymore? Yeah. So uh, first thing that we do is we make a list of all the stressors and all the triggers that lead a person, let's say, to the behavior. So that's the first thing. And once we find the stressors and the triggers, what we do basically is we create a preemptive plan in which we, we would, for example, reprogram our subconscious with phrases, for example, in which we will tell ourselves, for example, I feel a craving to do X, but the reality it's a craving to do Y. And then we will put in, depending on what the client prefers, we will put in some routines. Some routines could be basically waiting, for example, just wait, <laughs> just wait 15 minutes, just put a timer and wait 15 minutes. And uh, basically the rationale behind that is that I would ask a client if he ever did, for example, a fast, if he ever did fasting. And uh, if the answer is yes, then things are easier. And I would ask him like, when you fast, like, do you have like cramps in your stomach sometimes? And the answer is yes. And then the next question is, okay, what happens if you don't eat? Nothing, <laughs> nothing happens. It's just 10 to 15 minutes of cramps and then everything disappears. So that's, that's one way. And it's going to depend on the client, to be honest, because some methods work well. I have like 15 methods, 10, no, maybe 10. And we basically, I just give them to the client and I just tell them, yeah, yeah, try a bunch of them. And the ones that you prefer, just keep using them. Hmm. So that's one part. So you have the subconscious part and the more scientific part, which is the dopamine part, which is all the dopamine that you got for free. You need to give it back. You need to give your debt back. You need to pay the bank, uh, the loan that you took, which is basically to insert in your day activities, which require effort and pain which normally are, you know, going to the gym, getting into the sauna, uh, eating good food, sun rays, these kind of things, because the dopamine, uh, the dopamine debt still needs to get paid to get your, let's say your receptors to baseline. Interesting. Now the wait 15 minutes thing is really interesting. So like somebody sees content that triggers, they want to look at porn or, or they want to play a video game or they want to doom scroll on social media, just set a timer, 15 minutes. Don't think about it again for 15 minutes or don't act for 15 minutes. Is that basically it? Yeah. Yeah. Or I would use again, like the swish technique, which is, uh, I would basically put in one, in one square, let's say the trigger which let's say I want to look at adult content. So I would have like, let's say a certain image there. So I would put that image there. I will put another image of what I want to do in the, let's say in the left corner in bottom left. And then I will make that image bigger, bigger, bigger. And that image would like make the other image go away. And if you do this enough, then when you have the trigger, your trigger is associated with the new action, which might be, I don't know, like going for a walk or drinking some water. How important is it to, or how do you 
coach people in recognizing triggers because I remember when I when I quit drinking, it wasn't an overnight thing. It was a I knew I needed to stop and it took about a year mm -hmm. to actually stop. And part of that was definitely paying attention to triggers. I I would drive home from work, I'd see a gas station. I I remember these internal conversations that I didn't even realize were happening for a while until I started trying to look at quitting. I'd be like, oh, I'm not going to drink today. And I get toward the closer to the gas station. I say, I worked pretty hard today. You know, and you start rationalizing yeah. your behavior. And then yeah. by the time you get by the gas station, it's like, I'm going to pull over and yeah. grab a six pack, 12 pack, yeah. whatever it might be. Yeah. How do you help people figure out what those triggers are? Because I'd imagine it's not always obvious when you're in, in the thick of things. Mm -hmm. So I would basically ask them for the first week or two, just to think about the trigger and don't care about if they relapse. We mm -hmm. just want data basically. And uh, let me use actually your example of the gas station. So let's say their trigger is the gas station. So what I will tell them is, you know that the trigger is the gas station, so I want you to be ready. And being ready means playing with our desires. Because in that moment in the gas station, that means you desire to drink. That means if I'm able to create a bigger desire, you wouldn't drink because the new desire will be higher than the drink. So let's say you are, before getting to the gas station, you're already preparing yourself because you know you're getting to the trigger, like you're gonna get triggered. Imagine yourself repeating this phrase. I wanna abstain from drinking because I wanna be, uh, let's say, the best boyfriend I can be. I don't know if you have a girlfriend. And you just kept repeating this and basically visualizing yourself having the time of your life with your girlfriend without you drinking. That's me playing at your, in your subconscious level, creating a desire, which is so much higher than drinking that drinking just, you're not thinking about drinking because if you yeah. say to yourself, I don't want to drink at the subconscious level, you're saying to yourself, I want to drink. Because your subconscious doesn't really understand the difference between doing something and not doing something. So what you do is you're creating an action, which is being the best boyfriend I can be, which by the way, you need to visualize. You need to visualize how it feels for you to be the best boyfriend that you can be. And you need to feel how good does it feel because it's at, at, a, at a desire level. What we're doing is we are creating a desire we are creating a situation which is more desirable than you drinking. We're not telling yourself to stop drinking. We're saying to ourselves, I want to abstain, which is a positive action. It's not a negative action. I want to abstain from drinking because I want to be the best boyfriend I can be so I can have a good time with my girlfriend and my family so I can be more present. And you will yeah. visualize yourself feeling that way. You will feel that such that the desire now is all on the side of me being the best man I can be. That's how we do it. You don't tell yourself to not do something because when you tell yourself to not do something, it's like you're giving oxygen to that action. Yeah. You're giving yeah. oxygen don't to that thought. Okay. Yeah. So what you want to do is you want to give all your oxygen to something else, which yeah. is not, it's not that you are distracting yourself. It's not about distracting yourself here. Yes, we are literally saying, I want to abstain from this action because it doesn't help me. I mean, I'd rather use because I want to be X, Y, Z. When, when somebody is just trying to figure out what those triggers are, you mentioned don't try to necessarily stop the behavior, mm -hmm. just pay attention to the trigger. So what does that look like? So somebody thinks about doom scrolling or going to porn or in my past case, drinking, like go ahead and go with the behavior, but just be observant of what led to the behavior. Is that more what you're yeah, thinking? Yeah, just pick a, pick a piece of paper and just write down every trigger. And I don't care if you relapse because all we want is data. We will think about not relapsing later. Again, yeah. we cannot fight something that we don't see. We can't. So first we need to see it. And if they relapse because uh, it was a trigger then they forgot about, good. Now we have a new data point. So it's going to happen the next time now. Yeah. 
that's pretty much it. Yeah. Interesting. As you've gone on this journey, what, where did you learn from? Like, who did you, what books did you read? What uh, resources did you go to, to learn about all these concepts and to get where you're at today? So I'd say, uh, first of all, it was YouTube. Uh, I remember the first one that I really like liked when he was talking about this was Andrew Huberman. Hmm. Really good content. And then I, I read some books as well. And then I got into a bit of hypnosis as well. Like I, I did the course in, in hypnosis to understand more, uh, the subconscious. And, uh, actually I found really interesting things and I can give you an example. Like people think that. People that are overweight, they eat a lot because uh, they're not disciplined or they don't care. But in reality, most of the times there is a, there is a bigger issue, which could be that I eat a lot because all that extra weight is an armor against the outer world. It's what? An armor. Oh, an armor. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah, yeah. It's a security from the outside world. Let's say you are, I mean, not you, let's say there is a girl which, uh, which is like really young, a really beautiful girl, which is really young. I say the girl, she experienced some nasty experience with some familiar, with someone of her family. And then she gets, let's say, uh, she gets looked at as not being a good girl by other guys. And then she gets into a relationship and then she gets mistreated by a guy again, because, you know, because she's a girl or whatever. Then what happens is that the brain needs to find a way to protect you. So in that case, uh, let's say the girl cannot learn martial arts. What it will do is, okay, let's start overeating. Let's start gaining weight so that such that I'm not getting attention in the first place. So nobody can hurt me now. Hmm. Interesting. Those are the reasons that when you work through them, you understand, because if I'm able to show to this person that Actually, there's nothing to fear, which of course is going to take time. It's going to take, you know, unraveling the situation, understanding the situation. Then the reason why they are, let's say, overeating just disappears. And now they can start losing the weight. Yeah. How, how does social media factor in there? Because, uh, like, for overeating, for instance, people are on social media and women, I think, tend to compare themselves more mm -hmm. with other women on social media. Yep. I think that's a pretty big problem. And then we obviously have a problem with obesity. We have a problem with social media and comparing ourselves to each other. Does Do you think that could feed into overeating To Like, I can't be that, so there's no reason to try. Mm, I think it could be, I think it could be, I don't know how prevalent it is, but I think it could be, of course you have like the two extremes, like not eating at all and overeating. Yeah. And, yeah. um, yeah, it could be actually, yeah, it could be. Hmm. What are, what are the challenges you've seen with women with social media specifically? Are there any specific things that you focus on there? Uh, I haven't worked with many women. Mm. I prefer to work with men. It's just more okay. relatable to me. Nothing against women. Yeah. I love women. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd say for women, most it's, um, uh, yeah, it's comparison. It's comparing themselves to someone else. Oh, she looks yeah. like that. Or she, she's doing this and I'm not doing that. Even from a work perspective, I say women on LinkedIn. Oh, she's mm -hmm. the same age as me and she's already a, I don't know, a C level, whatever BS is out there. And I'm not yeah. this. So yeah. there it's more of a, again, intentionality. It's more of a using other people's success as look, actually it's possible to be successful because I know this person and I know I can be successful as well, or I can put in the effort. So you would use other people's success as actually motivation rather than, uh, putting yourself down. Yeah. 
Makes sense. Uh, when you mentioned Huberman Labs, I'm a big fan of his podcast. What was it about that podcast that, or his content that drew you in? Was it, is it the scientific approach to it, like the science back? That's what I like to hear. Yeah, yeah, the science and the precision that he has as well. Yeah. How much, I mean, you said you've had screen addiction issues in your life. Where is your life now compared to where it would be had you not gotten that under control? I would just love for you to mm -hmm. think that through and kind of give some insight into that. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, so first of all, I wouldn't be on this podcast. <laughs> Second, I wouldn't be working on my online business. And third, I would say I would be content with the minimum. So I would be satisfied with like the bare minimum. And I will not, let's say, fight or put in the effort what, for what really matters to me. I will just mm -hmm. get by, do my job, get home, play video games, scroll on social media. And just, yeah, just rinse and repeat for the rest of my life, probably. I know you work with people who are more motivated, but what would your message be to people who aren't taking a look at that? Maybe people who are playing video games and they don't want to acknowledge that there's anything wrong with it and uh, spending more time on social media, things like that. They, they, they aren't really analyzing it and seeing if there's an issue there. Like, What would your general message be for that? Yeah, so my general message actually would be it's not completely their fault because like especially western society i mean even eastern society it's just society in general to be honest that's how society is like uh engineered it's engineered to make people distracted to make people stressed out yeah yeah and to make people like waste time because when you do that then again you are auto disqualifying yourself from your competition because whether we like it or not we are all competing either for attention uh, for money, for the next race, for the next promotion. So an easiest way, again, instead of fighting against you, I will give you tools to just auto disqualify yourself. Hmm. So I would tell them like, it's not completely your fault. However, when you have the knowledge, then it becomes your fault because now we have the knowledge before. No, because again, it's a, like there are deeper things happening. Uh, like we, we were speaking about subconscious first, right? So the subconscious it's formed between the age of zero to seven. So that means what happens there has a huge impact on how we live our life. And generally what happens is that our subconscious, which is our, let's say how we react to things kicks in when we are stressed. Mm. So if I'm somebody. Uh, let's say that ha that doesn't really have like your our well being like it doesn't really care about our well being. What I will do is I would program you the way I want with television, with social media, with whatever BS I want to program you from zero to seven, and then I will make sure that the environment makes you stressed, overwhelmed, uh, anxious, depressed as much as you can, because in that case you would work on autopilot. So you would react subconsciously to what's happening. However, since I am the one that has programmed your subconscious, that means I am in control of your reaction. Mm. That's it. That's, that, that's the playbook. Yeah. That's the playbook right there. And that's why certain people, certain, sorry, not certain people, certain things might be normal in certain countries and tough people, they might come from other countries. And not so tough people might come from some other countries. That's, that's how, that's how, of yeah. course you can change that. And that's another reason why they don't teach this in school. Like you never heard hear about like even conscious mind or subconscious mind in school, because it's like giving you like the, the solution, but mm. why would they give you the solution? If my goal is to make you react the way I want you to react. That's, uh, that's the truth.
Yeah, I I love that you you both touch on that it's not necessarily your fault. It's not all your fault, but it is your fault once you have that knowledge cuz there really are there are very powerful entities making a lot of money by keeping these systems in place that keep people attached to screens and and addicted to these these things and it it's I mean, it's a very powerful thing to have to overcome. But once you have that knowledge of like, oh yeah, like I'm just being manipulated all the time, I can do something about this now. Once you have that power, it is very much in your control. So I love that you distinguish between that. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned you did like some books and stuff like that. Are there any specific books you recommend or anything? Mm, not specific books. I wouldn't say specific. It's more uh, pieces here and pieces there. Like, to be honest with you, I don't even remember like the names of the book. I think one was called, which wasn't that practical, but like it gave you a lot of insight. It's called Irresistible, which is a book about basically people uh, on their phones. Yeah. And, uh, and then a bunch of other books. It was also like peer reviewed research of people like doing actual studies to see like yeah. uh, brain scans and what happens if you like stop for a week, uh, what's the benefits, what are like the collateral effects, all of these things. And then it's basically, it's, uh, it's adding layers to, to the skill set. It's accepting yeah. that at the start, it's not going to be clear. And then as you make it clear, you understand, oh, I should go into this direction. I should go into that direction. Yeah. And basically. And I'm still in the process of deepening my understanding about this thing, yeah. which is, I mean, at the end of the day, it's literally like understanding myself and other humans more. So it's like a win-win situation at the end of the day. Yeah. I think anytime you're, I mean, there's so much knowledge out there and we only have so much time in our days. Like it's, it's all about that continuous journey. Like once you stop, trying to learn yourself. I'm, I'm sure it would be a lot harder to coach people because mm -hmm. that's part of your process is you're, you're constantly learning. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My program is, I mean, not completely different. There are still some pieces that were there at the start, but a lot of pieces have been added and some other pieces have been, uh, yeah, replaced or removed. Yeah. Well, Jacob, it's been awesome talking to you today. It's been Thank really you. insightful. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to give you a chance to tell listeners where they can reach you, where they can find you to work with you, and then anything else you feel like sharing. Uh, so I'm mainly active on X. I have I have a YouTube channel in which I don't think I have subscribers, but I don't want YouTube subscribers. It's fine. <laughs> but I just post videos there. I just got. I just wanted to get into the habit of posting videos. So yeah. I have a small YouTube basically with some videos of me, like talking about things that we, we have talked about today as well. And then I'm mainly active on X at the coach Jacob. You will find me there and yeah, feel free to send me a DM to ask questions or on if you want to work with me and you, and you, and you respect your time. Yeah. That's, that's important to say, <laughs> then yeah. feel free to reach out. Otherwise I'm happy to give you to give you some direction and some tips. Awesome. Well, Jacob, it's been awesome talking to you. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple. It goes a long way in helping the podcast grow and reach more listeners. You can also like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you want to support the show, you can go to FractalZoo.net where I have unique fractal inspired clothing. Each purchase goes directly toward helping the podcast grow. I'll also leave my Amazon affiliate link in the description. You can click on that before making an Amazon purchase and a small commission may go to the podcast. I love to connect with my audience. So find me on Twitter or X at RDTM podcast. That's A-R-T-I-E-T-M podcast. Or you can find me on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for listening today. That's it for this one. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.